in speech after speech in the U.S. House of Representatives. I've described what's going on in Washington, D.C. today as a steamroll of socialism being driven by Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, and fueled by Barack Obama. Steamroll of socialism. That's exactly what's going on in Washington today. <clears throat> How things have changed since this country was founded. In September 1787, as the Constitutional Convention was wrapping up, word was going about town about what was happening there in Philadelphia. And in fact, it was spreading like a wildfire. One day, as Benjamin Franklin stepped out of the meeting hall, a woman stopped him and asked him and said, Sir, what have you given us? Franklin replied, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. And that has been the charge of what's the most powerful words in the U.S. Constitution, we the people. It's now up to us to make sure that the federal government does not grow too large or too powerful. The John Birch Society exists because you believe just in that fact. Every one of you believes in personal freedom and in limited government. You wouldn't be here tonight. You believe that the federal government has no right to run up the national debt with stimulus bills and bailouts. You believe that a person should own a house when they can afford it, not when the government gives them one. You believe that the Constitution does not give government the right to take over your health care. Tell your doctor what procedures he or she can do. Tell private companies which cures they can create or what cars should be driven. The federal government has done or is trying to do all of these things. It is taxing those whom it believes make too much money. And it is redistributing the money to others. We must change this trend. <laughs> and in the current political environment, we can. The American people are beginning to wake up. They're no longer sure if they'll have a job tomorrow. They're worried that the government is going to mess with their health care. They're no longer sure if their children or grandchildren will have the same standard of living that we have today. To change things, I believe we must fight back against the three biggest threats to our liberty. Judicial activism, an immoral tax code, and a Congress that continues to spend, 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 and regulate, regulate, regulate. First, the tax code. In 1930, the U.S. tax code was a hefty 500 pages long. Today, it has swollen to the cumbersome length of over 45,000 pages. Even the IRS agents cannot understand it. And it is full of provisions that have too often produced negative results. Today, each and every American is as familiar with the current tax code as they are with the last time that they stubbed their toe or smashed their finger. Just as each physical injury has left a memory of pain and discomfort, each tax requirement has burned a memory of stress and anger. Congress is turning America against itself with every new tax. As a rule, as a congressman, I put a four-part test to every piece of legislation that crosses my desk. Four-part test. The first, is it right? We only have one standard of what's right, and that's the Judeo-Christian, the biblical principles that this country was founded upon. Amen. Second, is it constitutional? And I mean, is it constitutional according to the original intent? what James Madison and company meant for the Constitution to be. The third question is, do we need it? And the fourth, can we afford it? Most of the time, the legislation fails at least one of these tests. Most times, it fails all four. And I vote against it. 
All four questions have to be yes for me to vote yes. The American people have stood against new taxes time and time again because the current tax system is not moral, is not constitutional, is not needed, and is not affordable. This government of takers has imposed an immoral death tax, an anti-growth capital gains tax, and anti-capitalist business taxes with supposed social benefits. Of these, it is absolutely immoral for Congress to allow death taxes to stand. The government has no business inflicting more stress on those in our society that are already mourning the loss of a loved one. It's only natural for a person to want to pass down the fruits of a lifetime of labor to their family members. We should allow that to happen without the Internal Revenue Service's intervention. How can people trust a government is perceived to be so controlled by greed. Congress has got to understand every time a new tax is passed, there will be unintended consequences and unfair results. As Thomas Jefferson so appropriately stated, quote, taxation is, in fact, the most difficult function of government and that against which their citizens are most apt to be refractory. The general aim is, therefore, to adopt the mode most consonant with the circumstances and sentiments of the country. The people do not want these taxes, and the government do not, does not need them if it was functioning according to the original intent of the Constitution. The people just want to be treated fairly. I'm a supporter of the fair tax. I'd like to see us repeal the 16th Amendment. But folks, it's not about how they get taxes. It's how those taxes are spent. I believe very firmly if 10% is good enough for the Lord, it ought to be good enough for Uncle Sam. <laughs> and frankly, the Lord needs more money than our government does for his work in this country. We should support our free market by eliminating, eliminating, unfair corporate taxes. It's not the government's place to redistribute wealth. I believe that death taxes should be zero. I believe that corporate taxes should be zero. I believe that dividend taxes should be zero. And I believe all taxes should be very low. But we've got to reduce the size of government to get there. As the great Winston Churchill once said, Quote, for a nation to try to tax itself into prosperity is like a man standing in a bucket and trying to lift himself up by the handle. <laughs> Unquote. Cutting taxes and reigning in the federal government is fundamental to returning power to the citizens and pro promoting economic growth in America. I'm working real hard to try to do that. Along with promoting economic growth, we should also promote economic consistency and stability. We can only do that by eliminating, eliminating capital gains taxes. Just as businesses should not be penalized for being successful, investors should not be penalized for making good decisions and supporting good companies. If we allow freedom in the marketplace, then we will encourage a society in which individuals trust and invest in others and form a community, a more perfect union but if Congress continues to tax people into making a better world, according to them, it will create an even bigger bureaucratic monster. We must also rein in the executive and judicial branches. A great man once said, quote, government is not reason nor eloquence. It is force, and like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearsome master, unquote. That great man, was George Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a big, strong force that is trying to become more and more a master of you and of me. That force is judicial activism. 
And if we don't stop it, we will soon find ourselves all out of liberty. And we'll be subject to the will of individuals. We'll lose the rule of law and be ruled by the rule of man. In fact, in Proverbs we read, there's a way that seems right now as a man, but his path is the way of death. And it'll be the death of this country if we don't stop it. When thinking about today's Supreme Court, I also think about how far Congress and the federal government has strayed from what our founding fathers intended. We need judicial leaders who rely solely on the original principles laid forth in the Constitution. We do not need some man or woman who tries to prove that what James Madison really meant when he wrote this article or that section of the Constitution. We know what the founders meant because they wrote it down. We can read it very clearly. We can go to the Federalist Papers. We can go to the writings of our founders. They wrote voluminously. The judges ought to pay attention. They didn't intend for us to have to figure out their intentions, nor did they believe that they were writing a perfect, omnipotent document that would rule forever as it was. That is why the Constitution is so great. It is because we don't have to manipulate it for our own purposes. We, the people, can amend it if that is really needed. Thank God they made it difficult to do so. The Supreme Court justices also need to know the difference between a policy and a constitution. Policy changes and is the result of compromises made by the representatives of the people. Con the constitution is unchanging until amended. The constitution said, says, this is the foundation of our country and our civilization. A judicial activist says, this is what I think the foundation should be. There is a difference between judicial review and judicial action. We want judicial review because we want to know when a law is unconstitutional and in conflict with our foundations and principles. But we don't want judicial action because we don't want the judiciary to act at all. In fact, I was talking to one of the most conservative Democrat Blue Dogs recently about an issue and I pulled out my pocket constitution and I asked him, where is it in the constitution? He said, it's in there. And I handed it to him, tried to, and said, show me. He said, I've memorized the constitution. I'm, under, I'm a constitutionalist. And I said, well, show it to me in the document. And he got mad at me. <laughs> and he said, the constitution is what a federal judge says it, that it is. This is one of the most conservative Blue Dog Democrats in Congress today. In fact, I think very strongly that words make a difference. Words make a big difference. We hear a lot of us say, we want the judges to interpret the Constitution. I don't want them to interpret the Constitution. I want them to apply the Constitution. Yeah. We have a Congress and a President and a people for action. Frankly, we have all the action that we need in this country. What we really need is a judiciary that doesn't act, but reviews based on the original intent of the, the document, the Constitution of the United States. Today, the executive and judicial branches are sadly doing the job of the legislative branch. In fact, it's the legislative branch, in fact, the House of Representatives, to make monetary policy. That's the reason I'm against the Fed. And this is, we have presidents as well as Congresses, no matter whether the Democrats are, are Republicans who are in the majority, or in the White House, or in the Speaker's chair, that are activists, and they're destroying the foundations. 
for this nation. President George Bush went forward with the auto bailout despite Congress's, many of us in Congress's clear opposition. In fact, we even offered him alternatives. We talked to Hank Paulson, his Democratic CFR Treasury Secretary, and they wouldn't hear of our, any other idea except for the TARP bailout. President ba ba Barack Obama's created numerous unconstitutional czars with massive powers that are unconstitutional. And these czars, many of them are not even confirmed by the U.S. Senate. And they're setting policy, which is totally against the U.S. Constitution, as I assume all of you know. President Obama has also initiated a budget that will add debt more than all of his predecessors combined, from George Washington through George W. Bush. His budget that he presented to Congress back in January creates more debt than every president in the history of this nation. Executive orders was, were once rarely used, but today they have become the norm for presidents to bypass Congress and judicial review. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, judicial orders, unless they're just administrative, are unconstitutional, and we need to stop executive orders. <laughs> Today, our federal benches are filled with judicial activists. I don't have to tell you all that. These folks who are hell-bent on legislating from the, from the bench. When is this madness going to end? Finally. We must stop Congress from continuing to spin like drunken sailors. Will Rogers, a very funny speaker, one time said, the difference between death and taxes is death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. And here's a more prophetic one from Thoreau. Quote, if we were left solely to the wordy wit of legislators in Congress for our guidance, uncorrected by the seasonal experience and effectual complaints of the people, America would not long retain her rank among the nations." Unquote. That's the conspiracy that Jack just so eloquently talked to us about. Thoreau gave us that quote over a hundred years ago. What's the current state of our nation. We owe billions to China. We're dependent upon the natural resources of countries run by dictators. Nations that hate us and want to destroy everything that we stand for. The president is trying to add a third wheel to the doctor-patient relationship and put a government bureaucrat between you and your doctor. And we keep re-electing folks who support these policies. American parents today, for the first time in American history, are uncertain whether their children will have the same quality of life that we currently enjoy. If we continue down this economic track that we're on right now, ladies and gentlemen, they will not. We're stealing our children and grandchildren's future in Congress with this outrageous spending. We must stop the spending and we must stop it now. There are enough people in this, in this room to start a big movement. In fact, just in this organization, what Jack and Art are doing and staff and all the others here, I encourage. I'm excited about what they're doing. What my friend Nolan Cox from Valdosta and others are doing to start this Tea Party movement gives me great hope. I spoke to the Tea Party movement folks in Augusta, Georgia back last summer. And then this fall, there was another group called Stop Obamacare, SOC, that I spoke to. I see a waking giant starting to arouse. We need to wake it up. We need to wake that sleeping giant up. Just statistically in this room, the folks in this room 
right now, this moment, have influence statistically in virtually every single congressional district in America. Think about that. You have influence in every single congressional district, all 435 in America, just statistically in this room, certainly within every state. The only way we're going to stop Obamacare, the only way we're going to stop the energy tax, I call it tax and trade because it's about revenue, it's not about energy. Those two go hand in hand. President Obama said he needs the energy tax passed to be able to fund his health care reform. In fact, they talk about anthropogenic climate change, fancy words, probably so that people don't understand. They're hard for me as a Georgian to pronounce even. <laughs> but they used to talk about global warming. Y'all might remember a few years ago they were talking about an ice age was coming. It's the same folks. It's those who want to change America, who want to rule America, want to change us to a new world order. President George Herbert Walker Bush, remember, very openly said he wanted to have a new world order. And all of these things are just a progression of their outward effort to destroy America, destroy our freedom, destroy our free markets, destroy free enterprise and the, the market system we have in our nation today. But first and foremost, we've got to stop Obamacare. And we've got to stop that energy tax. And the only way we're going to do it is we've got to think about what former U.S. Senator Eric Dirksen one time said. He said, when he feels the heat, he sees the light. <laughs> now, what he meant by that is if he's heading in one direction, since as Jax told us, most politicians' only principle that they stand firm on is their own reelection bid. If they're heading in one direction and they just get letters, phone calls, faxes, emails, personal visits saying, Buster, you're heading in the wrong direction. And there's enough of that heat applied, they start seeing the light. We need the light of grassroots, grass fire all over this nation to say no to Obamacare and no to the energy tax. What I want you to think about doing is going home, looking through your Rolodex, looking through your email file, look through every yearbook, every club membership book, anybody that you know anywhere in this country, particularly if they live in a Democrat senator's state or in a Democratic congressman's congressional district, and call them write them, email, beg them to contact their member of Congress to say no to Obamacare and no to the energy tax. We've got very little time, folks. We may have just a few weeks. But I also want you to think about Amway, how it works. When you contact those people within your sphere of influence, get them to do the same thing. And if we, just think about it, if you contact 10 people, I hope you'll contact a lot more than that, but if you contact 10 people, and they contact 10, and they contact 10, you've got over 1,000 people just under your pyramid lighting those grass fires and putting heat on members of Congress. The John Birch Society is trying very hard to get the right kind of people elected to Congress. There are very, very few of us. Very few. In fact, frankly, I was just talking to Art, Ask him how many he thought. I'll tell you, right now today in the U.S. Congress, there are two members of Congress who believe in the original intent, and that's me and Ron Paul. <laughs> We've got to put heat on the members of Congress. I'm doing that with everybody I come in contact with, and I need you to do the same. Folks, the future of this country depends upon you. It's not good enough just to belong to John Birch Society, and I applaud you for doing so. 
I applaud you to come out tonight. I applaud you for giving money to the John Birch Society. I encourage you to, whatever you've given, it's not enough. You need to give it more. We need to identify people and educate politicians about what the Constitution's all about. In Hosea 4, 6, we read, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We have a tremendous lack of knowledge in America about the Constitution, the original intent. Psalm 11, we read, If the foundations be destroyed, what are the righteous to do? And I believe this is a call to arms, a call to duty, for us to rebuild those foundations. We've got to get engaged in the fight every day. And I know many of you are. What I'm here today to do is encourage you. It's important. It's extremely important. Because if we don't stop the steamroll of socialism, this country is going to be destroyed. We're going to lose our liberty. We're going to lose our property. We're going to lose our freedom. We're going to lose everything this country was founded upon and has made it so successful. The future of this nation rests in your hands. Your children, your grandchildren, depend upon you. They depend, they depend upon what you do over the next few weeks, in the next few weeks, not only the next few weeks, but the next few months and next couple of years. What will your answer be? God bless you.